One thing you might notice with these kinds of history videos is I'll be talking about one thing, but then something else will overlap with it. I'll probably end up speaking about one main topic, but mention another topic, and then I can split that into an extra video on its own so that you get all the lovely information that you might want or need from this kind of stuff. It will usually come as part of a paragraph that just explains something. It'll mention somebody, something, or somewhere, and I'll think, yeah, actually, that's one we need to look at in the future because of this, 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 and this. And then usually what will happen is I'll eventually get round to doing it. There's no set to-do list of these. I just do whatever I feel like doing, to be honest. But at least when that connected video does get released, I hope there's an, oh yeah, you mentioned that in this video reaction from those watching. It's all about callbacks, you know, like in comedy, except I'm not a comedian. So really, this one is a callback to the video I did on the downfall of Brabham, and I was talking about Bernie Eccleston owning Brabham and how those years were just free content within themselves. So with this particular video, I want to talk about how Bernie, who was the owner of Brabham at that time and the Feast of Folk of War, might have cost Carlos Reutemann the World Championship in 1981. The Feast of Folk of War, along with the 1994 season, are probably the longest series I've done within the whole story time franchise i mean that's a buzzword loads of youtubers like using isn't it a franchise in the racing history space and so on but anyway as it so happens those two mini series are probably my favorite parts of formula one history purely because of how much stuff there is out there and we'll probably never know the full story of what actually happened the FISA Folk of War was a series of political and business related battles waged by FISA, what we now refer to as the fia and FOCA, the formula one constructors association both sides represented two distinct groups. FISA was basically the exclusive club of the manufacturer teams and headed up by the FIA's French president Jean-Marie Balestri, while FOCA was led by Bernie, who, as already established, owned the Brabham team, while simultaneously being more and more involved in Formula One's commercial expansion. One battle had already been fought within 12 months of the story taking place. At the 1980 Spanish Grand Prix, the FIA fined the majority of the FOCA aligned teams for not turning up to driver's briefings at the Belgian and Monaco Grand Prix, despite the rules saying that they didn't have to be there. And if the fines weren't paid, the drivers who didn't show up would be stripped of their racing licenses, a threat that was non-negotiable. Thanks to King Juan Carlos of Spain, the race at Harama went ahead, but without the sanctioning of FISA and without their aligned teams. So everybody on the grid was running a DFV, and Alan Jones won the race. Although given Jones' gap over PK come the end of the 1980 season, I don't think this race running would have changed anything really, unless you bring in the whole they would have driven differently in the other rounds of the season thing that a lot of people bring up with the whole Felipe Massa situation, which might get referenced again at some point during this video. But if I can find more information on that particular race, I might have to do a full video on it. See what I mean? You talk about one thing and you go, ooh, that might be interesting later on. Big brain moments. Anyway, Jones won the season and came into 1981 as the reigning champion and the first Australian to be the reigning champion since 1967. 1981 was also the first year where it was called the FIA Formula One World Championship as opposed to the World Championship of Drivers and the International Cup of Constructors. And thanks to the first ever Concord Agreement that would be signed a few months later, the team knew their place in terms of commercial obligations and were now contracted for the season rather than just races. This Concord Agreement also meant that from 1982 onwards, teams had to own the intellectual rights of their cars. So the days of buying an off-the-shelf car like some privateers had done in the 70s with March, and then Cooper, Brabham and Lotus in the 60s, well those days were going to be over soon. The season was scheduled to be 16 races long, starting in South Africa in February and then ending in Las Vegas on the 17th of October. Along the way it would stop in Rio, Buenos Aires, Imola, Zolder, Monte Carlo, Harama, Dijon, Silverstone, Hockenheim, Spielberg, Zandvoort, Monza and Montreal. Montreal in September, I bet that race was fun. There was also supposed to be a race at Watkins Glen on the 4th of October, but this wouldn't mean that the final three races of the season would have been in North America. Due to financial difficulties with the venue, the state of New York refusing any financial help, and the drivers in general no longer being fans of the track, it was cancelled entirely and replaced with the meme that was the Caesars Palace car park. Also, the Brazilian Grand Prix was supposed to be into Lagos on an older 7.8km layout, but due to safety issues it was canned and moved to Jacarapagua instead. At this same time, Bernie and Foca were looking at organising their own breakaway series. I've done a video about that proposed breakaway series before, so if I remember, I'll do a card thingy for you. So that's the 1981 attempted split and the 2010 attempted split that I've done. 
but the people who attended the conference to announce that split barely had any money to get to said press conference. Mo Nunn, who owned the Ensign team, had just had to remortgage his house, and Colin Chapman had to pay for Ken Tyrrell to get to Paris. So what played into the hands of the Folk Aligned teams was that the people that organised the South African Grand Prix didn't particularly like Balestri either. So Kyle Army would have been the perfect place to have this Rebel Grand Prix, for want of a better phrase. And because the race always lost money, they just signed a new commercial agreement with a photocopier company, and all the contracts have basically put everything in place for a race to be held on the 7th of February, which was the date that the FIA had initially planned for the South African Grand Prix. But Balestri didn't like this idea at all and tried in any way possible to get the date shifted to the 11th of April. But the organisers had already promoted the race, sold tickets, printed posters, TV advertising done, sponsorship documents signed and everything done anticipating a 7th of February race. In fact, the contracts basically said, this is happening. The South Africans were also concerned about the weather, because April in Johannesburg is the same as October in Britain. I mean, you could just watch footage of the 2000 British Grand Prix for a reference as to how it could have ended up. So the South African Motor Racing Club who organised this particular event basically said to Blestry, cope harder, we're doing this whether you like it or not. Plus, this contract says we're doing this whether you like it or not. So... Yeah, it was all up in the air at that point. And also, there was the Argentinian Grand Prix that was supposed to be in January. But Lestri managed to get that moved, but couldn't do it with South Africa. But FISA had friends, those being the continental teams of Ferrari, Renault, Ligier, Acela and Alfa Romeo. I mean, sure, Ferrari, Renault and Alfa make sense because they're manufacturers, but Ligier was known to play the political game, given that Guy Ligier had actual political connections, while I believe there was a rule that prevented Osella from joining because of how long they'd been in F1. But the FIA sent a message to the South African organisers on January the 9th saying, look, if you want to have your race, you can, but we won't be there. If you do hold the race, it won't be an official World Championship race as per Article 237 of the rules, it'll be Formula Libre instead. For want of a better phrase, Formula Libre translates to free formula. Well, it is free formula, it's a literal translation of it, but to add an extra bit onto that, it basically means run whatever the f*** you want. The 11 teams that turned up, Williams, Lotus, Arrows, McLaren, Brabham, Theodore, Fittipaldi, ATS, Tyrrell, Ensign and March, understood the assignment. Anything that was banned on the cars suddenly reappeared. Illegal aero, illegal brakes, illegal whatever, it was there. Sliding skirts reappearing on the cars which had been banned at the end of 1979 or 1980. So you'd think then that the lap times fell, but they didn't. They were two seconds slower than they had been the previous year. And because it was non-championship, Avon and Pirelli weren't there to do tyre supply in an official capacity, but some tyres did make it there due to Bernie calling in a favour from the International Racing Tyre Service. They had some good years in stock, but they didn't have enough. They certainly didn't have any proper qualifying tyres. So each team had four sets maximum, while there was only one set of wets per car. Good thing it's the South African summer then, right? What's that? Oh. PK showed that he was the new fast kid on the block, putting his Brabham on pole ahead of Reutemann and Jones in the Williams cars that were the defending constructors champions. The gap between the top three was around half a second, with the 18 that set a time separated by 4.3 seconds. Alessio Salazar, who would engage in a spot of virtue fighter for realsies with PK a few years later, was dead last without a time, but he still started the race. On race day, it was raining. It had also rained on Friday and nobody had done any real running that day because they wanted to protect their only set of wet tyres. During qualifying on the Saturday, which was the second qualifying session they had, Reutemann had crashed pretty heavily and ended up in some catch fencing. The catch fencing then wrapped itself around his neck and started to choke him while he was in the car. But thankfully, the marshals got to him and got him out of the car before, well, the unthinkable happened and Reutemann was on a mission for this season. Carlos by this point was 39 and in the twilight of his career. He was at least at the world champion team and had shown he was good enough. He is one of only three drivers to have a pole position on his debut appearance, which was back in 1972. The other two are Mario Andretti who did it in 68 and Jacques Villeneuve who did it in 1996. Throughout his career he'd finished third three times and this would probably be his last attempt at winning the world championship, something not done by an Argentinian driver since Fangio. Reutemann and Keki Rosberg were the only two drivers to start the race on slicks. Everybody else had gone for wets, with the rain stopping just before the start of the Grand Prix. Carlos and Keki counting on the track drying quickly with the temperatures and the short track being cleared by 19 runners. 
Safe to say, both of those cars made awful starts. PK led into Turn 1 while Reutemann dropped to 6th or 7th as Jan Lammers in the ATS had made a Jean lazy style flyer from 10th. Also on the grid was Desiree Wilson, a driver who had signed a local hero deal, well, heroin in this case, with Tyrrell. She qualified 16th, and not much is known about the deal that was signed, but it was seen as a bit of a U-turn on Ken's part. He'd been criticising female drivers during 1980, and suddenly he had a seat available and took a driver that no doubt brought a bit of cash. She spun off on lap 52. But it was lap 11 where the dangers of running unrestricted cars began to appear. Jeff Lees went off at pretty much the same place as Reutemann, and he also ended up in the catch fencing. He also smacked his head on one of the actual poles holding the catch fencing up and knocked himself clean out. As things settled down, the order saw PK leading while Jones started a comeback drive, but then the track started to dry out not long after Lee's accident. Jones pitted first while Mansell was in soon after, but when Jones left the pits it was still a bit treacherous in places and he went off, damaging his car and he'd later retire with one of his skirts coming loose, which might be the last time a skirt caused a retirement. PK and Watson left it incredibly late to do their pit stops, and when they did do their pit stops, Reutemann inherited a healthy lead. He won the race by 20 seconds, lapping everybody except the top three. Well, you can't really lap yourself, can you? Sort it out, Aiden. So Reutemann's gamble had paid off to take the victory, with PK in second place and DeAngelis in third. Jones was the final retirement of the race with Sura, De Cesaris, Wilson, Salazar, Lammers, Sturr and Lees also not finishing. Derek Daly brought up the rear, three laps down in his march. But due to the fact that this was a non-championship race, no points were awarded. On a normal day, with Fieser and Foka not arguing the toss over what was what, Reutemann would have got nine points for winning the race, and PK would have picked up six. Under the rules of the time, which was basically the best 11 races of the season counted towards your final score, Reutemann would have won the championship, with 58 points versus PK's 56. Not the, uh, where is it? 50 to 49 that happened in real life. I need to sort this out, don't I? So is this race the reason that Reutemann lost the championship? It's tricky to call, but one thing that does need to be considered is that this race was never a world championship event to start with. FISA contacted the organisers in January and said that this would be the case. But another thing to consider is that at the Brazilian Grand Prix, Brabham turned up with their hydro pneumatic suspension and destroyed everybody there, despite that system being against the spirit of both the Maranello and Concord agreements, and then everybody copied Brabham once the FIA deemed the system to be within the rules. Also during the season, the relationship between Jones and Reutemann soured. At Long Beach the next round, Jones, the contractual number one driver, had allowed Carlos to win, but in Brazil he was miffed that the favour hadn't been returned. Despite Jones being the number one, Reutemann consistently scored more points to put him in championship contention, but then Vegas happened, which I've covered before. It would be the closest that Carlos would get to winning the world championship because after just two rounds of the 1982 season, he abruptly retired. His reasoning was that he was an Argentinian driver driving for a British team, and because of the Falklands war going on, he didn't want to be put in that awkward position because it was Argentina versus Great Britain if you're not into your military history or just history in general. Patrick Head called that an excuse though, he basically said nah his heart wasn't in it anymore and he just wanted out, but it is what it is. He'd then go into politics, being a prominent figure in the Santa Fe region and also the whole of Argentina. Some thought he'd become the president, but despite being asked to run several times, he declined every time. He'd pass away in 2021 due to complications following a brain hemorrhage. His daughter said that she'd asked Bernie to call her dad, saying that he was the real champion of 1981, which in a way connects to the recent news involving Felipe Massa. But like I said, the Feast of Folk War is one of my favourite parts of Formula 1 history. Out of the ashes of this battle, Formula 1 was on its way to becoming a multi-billion dollar industry, with commercial deals coming out of its arsehole and on television and having the stars that it's had since. Whether that's a good thing or not, well, again, that's one for you to decide in the comments. So then, a look at the 1981 South African Grand Prix and how it might have cost Carlos Reutemann the title. If this has been interesting for you, then do like the video so I know a good job was done. And for more like this, get subscribed with that bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the fine bunch of lads over at Patreon for the continued support. And if you want to help support me at a more personal level, there is a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and pieces you might want or need to know. All the super thanks down there too, and memberships if you want to do things that way. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye. <laughs>